Amnikov Froelich to our viewers on PBS in the United States and all of you joining from around the world. Of course, welcome. It's good to have you with us. Tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden tells Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that future support for the war in Gaza depends on Israel taking new steps to protect civilians and aid workers. The White House says Biden made clear in a phone call that Israel needs to implement specific and measurable steps to address civilian harm. This follows the death of seven aid workers in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza earlier this week. Now, Israel says a preliminary report from their probe into the incident has been completed and will be made public soon. Speaking at a NATO meeting in Brussels, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called on Israel to take concrete steps to protect civilians and facilitate access to humanitarian aid. We need to see an immediate ceasefire to enable the release of hostages, but also to enable um, a, a dramatic surge in humanitarian assistance, uh, as well as obviously better protecting uh, civilians. Now. Uh, as I said, the president and the prime minister just spoke, but it's uh, our expectation that um, Israel uh, will and certainly should announce concrete, specific, measurable steps that uh, it will take and take as soon as possible uh, to make sure that there can be an effective surge in assistance, that it can be sustained, uh, and that humanitarian workers and civilians are better protected. Now, today's call marked the first time that Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu have spoken since the attack on this aid convoy. DW Washington correspondent Benjamin Alvarez told us more. That's right. It was the first time between both leaders since this Israeli airstrike killed seven, eight workers in Gaza. According to the White House readout, President Biden called these strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza unacceptable. And probably the most important sentence of the readout is that President Biden made clear that, I quote, U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. And that is by far the the clearest hint of conditionality for military aid to Israel, something that many have been asking for months now, and that's something that the U.S. does with every other ally. So the killing of these seven world central kitchen aid workers in Gaza appears to mark an inflection point for Biden's support of Israel. Mm -hmm. So Biden told Netanyahu that future U.S. support for Israel will depend on protecting civilians. Does Washington have a clear red line here? And what could the consequences be? There is a big difference between saying something and between doing it, between setting a red line and then actually enforcing it. Just to give you an example, when President Biden said that launching a bombing campaign on Gaza's southern city of Rafa would be crossing a red line, he did not lay out the consequences. And we know that actions speak louder than words. Three U.S. officials told uh, the Washington Post U.S. media that the Biden administration approved the transfer of thousands more bombs to Israel on the same day that Israeli airstrike in Gaza killed the seven aid workers. So the White House, and that's what the White House has been accused of, of not using its leverage with Israel. The frustration is going not only with uh, Republicans, with the opposition, but also within uh, the Democrats that instead of conditioning, for example, ammunition, bombs, intelligence, President Biden is venting his frustration. The, the Biden administration is frustrated with the way uh, that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his government are waging this war in Gaza. And But we already see a shift. Just a few minutes ago, national security spokesperson um, said that the U.S. would already consider changes of the Israel policy if Israel doesn't make Gaza changes to this policy within hours of days, something that yesterday sounded quite different. So we see already a shift. But the big question now will be if there will be no actions, what the red lines will be and what the time set will be that the U.S. gives Israel uh, to see here if they will condition, if they change the aid that the U.S. is giving Israel. You'll be watching it closely for us. That was DW Washington correspondent Benjamin Alvarez. Thank you for the latest. Let's take this to journalist Sami Sokol in Jerusalem. Welcome, Sami. Now, the U.S. issuing a warning. We heard it there. How has the phone call between Biden and Netanyahu gone down in Israel? Uh, first of all, I must say that there hasn't been any readout. There hasn't been any press conference. There hasn't been any statement coming out from the uh, prime minister's uh, office. Um, 
uh, what we hear is a, a kind of like a very a vague leaks uh, from the prime minister's uh, office but we're just hearing things like the conversation uh, was almost an hour long uh, 45 minutes 50 minutes and this is contrary to what we hear from uh, Washington that the conversation was 30 minutes long and in terms of the content uh, we, we don't hear this kind of Of, of rhetoric uh, here. I mean, uh, it is disclosed that the conversation was uh, tough, but it's more like a uh, business as usual. I can, I can tell you that one uh, analyst here uh, who is quite close to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, uh, he was saying that a, a, what Biden has called for uh, is actually the surrender of Of Israel to Hamas and it looks like uh, Biden has a kind of like taken the pressure from the first uh, lady and the pressure of the first lady is in now in what's pushing uh, Biden President Biden so this is the only thing that we've heard so far all right you say business as usual but the US wants to see concrete and measurable steps from Israel and And an immediate ceasefire how likely is the Israeli government to listen I think we have to remind the viewers that uh, both the uh, defense secretary and the Secretary of State uh, were visiting here um, uh, at the end of uh, 2023 uh, and they they said that the United States is is uh, is not interested in this kind of aggressive uh, campaign uh, that it is concerned about the casualties of civilians that it would like uh, to see aid coming in that it opposes the Israeli uh, policy of uh, keeping the crossings to the Gaza Strip closed uh, which means that there is a uh, starvation in the northern part of the Gaza Strip And we've heard this time and again from American officials. So I don't think that there's anything uh, uh, new here. And uh, as we've heard from the correspondent in, in Washington, uh, the fact that uh, they have already approved uh, more munitions uh, to be shipped to Israel is a message that Israel is being backed by the United States. Mm. All right. That was journalist Sami Sokol in Jerusalem. Thanks for your take. Now, as we heard, Antony Blinken made his comments at a NATO meeting as that was getting underway. A spokesman for the Kremlin said relations between Russia and NATO have reached the level of, quote, direct confrontation. Moscow says this is due to the alliance's enlargement in recent years and its military support for Ukraine. Now, as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization celebrated its 75th anniversary in Brussels today, NATO allies vowed to keep supporting Ukraine's fight against Russia's invasion. The alliance is weighing a plan to provide long-term support for Ukraine, which is a task currently shouldered by individual member states. NATO at 75. But things aren't getting any easier with age. The alliance is facing huge challenges, from the threat posed by Russia and Ukraine and beyond, to a potential second Donald Trump presidency in the United States. Trump is is a NATO critic. But the bloc's chief has told DW about the need for a united stand. I expect that regardless of the outcome of the United States, the United States will remain a, a staunch NATO ally because that is in the U.S. security interest. The U.S. is stronger with NATO than without NATO. Still, to head off the Trump threat, Stoltenberg has made a proposal for NATO members to set up a 100 billion euro fund to provide military aid to Ukraine over the next five years. He says NATO should have a more direct role in delivering that aid. We have to remember that the criticism uh, from uh, former President Donald Trump and also from others in the United States has not been mainly against NATO. It has been against NATO allies, not paying enough for NATO. And the good news is that uh, NATO allies, including Germany, and many others are now really stepping up and investing more in defense. But it's still unclear 
whether the 100 billion euro proposal will be accepted by NATO members who take decisions by consensus. Hungary has already voiced its opposition. It comes as Russia has intensified its missile attacks on Ukraine in recent weeks, and Ukraine's foreign minister has reportedly cast doubt on NATO's ability to collect the funds. With the war now in its third year, he also said that what the country really needs is more air defense systems from the West. I don't want to spoil the party, but of course my message, the birthday party, but my main, my main message today will be patriots, because saving Ukrainian lives, saving Ukrainian economy, saving Ukrainian cities depends on the availability of patriots and other air defense systems in Ukraine. And we're talking about patriots because it's the only system that can intercept ballistic missiles. Western allies have been hesitant on this point, but for Ukraine, that would be cause for the biggest celebration of all. And our correspondent, Terry Schultz, has been following the gathering in Brussels. Here's her assessment. NATO would have wanted to celebrate its 75th anniversary, the most successful military alliance in history, but the world is just too difficult at the moment. There were some allies who wanted to talk about how happy they are with where they are now compared to where they were when NATO was founded, like Polish Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski, who said that in 1949, when NATO was created, his country got trapped, he said, on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, stuck there for the Cold War, before being offered NATO membership in the first round of enlargement in 1999. But despite the marching band and cake, it would have been impossible to be very festive here when you have Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba coming and saying, you know, NATO, all the best on your birthday, but my people are being slaughtered by Russian missiles, and we really need you to come up with some air defense. And all allies certainly understand his position and want to do more to help. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg did have some new contributions to announce at this meeting. Germany said it would come up with 600 million more euros for a Czech-led initiative to get more ammunition for Ukraine. The UK said it would give 10 thousand more drones. Finland said it would be uh, providing a package of 188 million more euros. But there's another shadow hanging over the alliance as well, and that is concern that the U.S. will not be the same partner in the future that it has been the past 75 years. And that may be regardless of whether Donald Trump regains the White House. This is something you hear throughout NATO speeches. Stoltenberg constantly reminding that NATO allies are spending more on their defense. And with a new proposal for a hundred billion euro package for Ukraine, that they would be doing more to support Ukraine as well. So while the alliance can certainly be uh, proud of its longevity for the last 75 years, it is going to have difficult days ahead between now and its next birthday. Ukrainian authorities say about 30 percent of the country is contaminated by Russian landmines, unexploded ordnance, and other explosives. Up to 174 thousand square kilometers of land are thought to be contaminated, posing a threat to civilian life and making it off limits for farming and other uses. Now, according to a survey by UN OCHA published last year, mines have been detected in 11 of Ukraine's 27 oblasts. Among the most contaminated regions are Mykolaiv, Kherson, Donetsk, and Kharkiv. Human Rights Watch points out that Ukrainian forces have also deployed landmines against Russian forces. Now, the area in need of checking and clearing is larger than Greece. DW's Aya Ibrahim traveled to Budi in northern Ukraine to meet some of those taking on this dangerous job. A year ago, Victoria was training to be a pastry chef. Now the 20-year-old is helping clear Ukrainian soil from unexploded Russian mines. She's doing so in a northern Ukrainian village previously occupied by Russia. This work is crucial for life to come back here. My brother is currently serving in the army for two and a half years already. My father was also called to the army. He passed the commission, but was not drafted. I also wanted to do my part, so I came to work here. I have a younger brother, and I would like him to walk on clean land. And so would my future children. 
по шести земли. И майбутние діти також. Victoria says when she first swapped her pastry apron for a metal detector, her mother panicked, insisting the job was too dangerous and not appropriate for women. But women are taking on new roles all through Ukraine to replace men who are at the front lines. The Halo Trust, an NGO that works to clear landmines and explosive devices, is seeing more women wanting to do the job. During my work, I meet a lot of our women and uh, actually they inspire me because uh, many of them like um, went out of zone of comfort because uh, they did uh, previously absolutely different uh, walks of life. For example, some was working making manicures, some was, was doctor anesthesiologist, someone was working as a teacher. And uh, now they decided that at the moment, maybe we need to clean first the land. Not far from Kiev, Yulia, who used to work in an office, trains new D-miners. I'm just delighted when they come the next day and can tell them what I told them yesterday. That's why I like being an instructor. We have many women whose husbands are at war, and these women are not standing by and crying, not waiting for them. Rather, they also take the position that the more we work on this, the sooner we will finish it all. Some estimates suggest it could take hundreds of years to clear all of Ukraine of landmines. These women are making a start. Yulia Osmolovska is the head of the Kyiv office of the security think tank Glob Sec, and she told me how the daily lives of Ukrainians are affected by explosive ordnance left by Russian troops. Yes, it definitely uh, affects the life. Uh, so according to our estimates, it's uh, roughly about 6 million of uh, Ukrainians affected uh, uh, by contaminated land. And second problem is that uh, despite uh, the active actions of the government and the NGOs that do enlightening work in explaining all this explosive risk, uh, um, uh, a lot of people still remain ignorant to that. Therefore, we have high level of casualties. Last year, for instance, we had over 600 cases which amounts for roughly 80 people per month. And the government wants, uh, warns that uh, if no proper uh, actions are taken in terms of uh, uh, this um, uh, explanatory work, uh, both for children and the older population, so uh, the amount of incidents could reach to 9,000 by 2030. Uh, what do you make of initiatives like the one we saw in that report just now, training people to become deminers themselves? Yes, it's, uh, it's very good. And we actually uh, uh, indicated this in our two reports that we made on the mining in Ukraine. Um, and especially we do confirm that there is a rising number of women for the, women for the same reason that you put in, in your coverage. Uh, at the same time, the problem remains uh, that uh, uh, regardless how many people you train, you have to equip all of them with personal protection kits and with the mine equipment. And this is something which Ukraine is actually uh, has a shortage at the moment. So this is where the assistance of international uh, partners are very much welcomed. Mm -hmm. Now, aside uh, of the, the points that you just mentioned, what would you say are the main challenges in demining a country that is, of course, also actively at war? Yeah, uh, so the challenges are plenty, uh, starting with that we still have unfinished war, definitely, and we don't know the exact figure of uh, how much of the land will be contaminated in the end. Uh, still 18% uh, of the territory is under occupation and uh, out of uh, 156,000 of uh, square kilometers which um, uh, are contaminated, only 45,000 square kilometers are available for survey. Uh, this is the main challenge. Then, as I mentioned, the equipment, lack of resources, even financial resources. For instance, estimates of World Bank that Ukraine might need uh, around uh, $3 billion of dollars annually. Still, for the two Two years of uh, uh, active engagement with the international community, we have received commitments and pledges for just 500 uh, um, uh, million of dollars uh, for that. So then uh, it's another big problem is about different range of explosive devices. It's more than 180 of different types. Uh, types. A lot of them are improvised devices, which makes the worst of demining very, very dangerous and uh, um, uh, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the, the problem with aquatic demining. Uh, 
uh, because this is something where Ukraine didn't have uh, a lot of experience in, and around uh, 15, around 14,000 square kilometers are of uh, aqua resources that are contaminated. So plenty of other problems uh, uh, to do this, but these are probably the main ones. That was Yulia Osmolovska, the head of the Kyiv office of the security think tank Globsec. Let's take a quick look now at some other stories making news around the world. Denmark has closed airspace and shipping traffic in one of the world's busiest sea lanes due to a faulty missile launcher. The incident happened during a naval exercise in the Great Belt Strait, the main maritime access to the Baltic Sea. Authorities say the faulty launcher couldn't be deactivated and warned of a risk of falling missile fragments. Finland has extended its border closure with Russia indefinitely due to what Helsinki calls a high risk of organized migration orchestrated by Moscow. Relations between the neighbors have soured over the war in Ukraine and Finland joining NATO last year as a response. Taiwanese rescuers are working to reach people trapped after Wednesday's earthquake as a massive cleanup operation begins. At least 10 people were killed and over 1,000 injured in the magnitude 7.4 quake. It was the island's worst earthquake in a quarter century. Armed resistance groups in Myanmar say they have caused casualties in a drone attack on the capital, Naypyidaw. The capital is the seat of power for the military junta that overthrew the democratic government in 2021. The main opposition group, which calls itself the National Unity Government, says allied rebel groups struck the airport and a military headquarters with drones. But the junta says it shot down the drones and claims no damage or casualties were caused. Let's bring in Isabella Todd. She's a coordinator with the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, an independent international expert group, and she joins me now from London. Isabella, welcome. Now, the junta is denying the rebels' claims of casualties in this attack. What are you hearing? Uh, well, it's hard to say. We don't really know. The military is very opaque regarding information about its casualties, but we are seeing local media reports that two soldiers were killed um, and up to perhaps another 15, including officers, were injured. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship between the rebel group behind this attack and the opposition national unity government? Well, there's an alliance uh, between the groups. There's a, a revolution uh, that's underway and all of these groups are working towards the same goal, which is to uh, end this military's role or attempted role in politics uh, and to establish federal democracy in the country. Mm -hmm. So the National Unity government coordinates with the rebel groups? Yes, that's right. They have a central command. This is a, an organized um, organization of rebel groups that are under the command of the National Unity Government uh, that is itself allied with other resistance organizations and forces fighting together across the country. Is there not a danger that, uh, that you know, this, this uh, violence, these attacks against the junta would undermine the democratic uh, um, proposals of the National Unity Government? Look, the military is already deploying all of the resources at its disposal to commit as much violence and suffering on the population as it possibly can, including through the use of really devastating airstrikes. So it's going to continue doing that unless and until it is stopped. So efforts to try and take out that capacity are really critical. And actually, it's a failure of the international community for not having stepped in and done more to stop the military's violence earlier, um, that we're seeing the situation escalate. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned it there, the junta has used airstrikes to devastating effect against the pro-democratic forces. Uh, to what extent do you think the use of drones against them can put their efforts on the back foot? Um, I, I, as I say, I, the trends that we're seeing are, are going to continue um, regardless. The military has demonstrated that its intention is to escalate its use of violence against the population. Um, that's very clear. Uh, the trajectory of the conflict has been consistent for the past three years. The resistance has been gaining control while the military has been losing control. Where it all ultimately ends um, isn't certain. Uh, but what is certain is that more violence will be inflicted on people unless and until this military is stopped. And that's where the international community has to come in with arms and bars 
embargoes, sanctions on aviation fuel and efforts to bring the leaders of this military to stand trial in international courts on charges of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. That was Isabel Todd, coordinator with the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar. Thank you. And a reminder of our top stories. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said there should be no higher priority in Gaza than protecting civilians. His comments come as the world waits for the release of an Israeli preliminary report into the killing of seven aid workers in the Gaza Strip earlier this week. NATO is marking its 75th anniversary with a ceremony in Brussels. Representatives from Ukraine are in attendance as NATO discusses a proposed long-term aid fund for Kyiv. The Kremlin says Russia and NATO are now in open confrontation. Stay with us now after a short break. I'll be back to take you through the day. We'll be looking at NATO at 75 and Germany's planned military overhaul. I hope you can join us. <laughs>